Hello, everyone, and welcome to Fiji Forever, silent podcast, almost spoiler-free recap of Survivor Fiji. While we wait for Survivor 44 to premiere, I will be spending the off-season recapping one of my favorite seasons of all time, Survivor Fiji. Today, we'll be covering Episode 6, I've Got Strength Now to Carry the Flag, which originally aired on March 21st, 2007. As a Survivor nerd myself, I am in mourning today as we officially say go- say goodbye to icon Anthony Robinson. Here to lament with me, or rather be fanboys about him with me, are two legends in their own right, Anthony Robertson and Michael J. Clark. Here we go. <laughs> Hello, you two. Hi. Yeah, it's Air. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, they, did they, I say they, Anthony? Yeah, you did. Oh my god! Okay, I'm sorry. Hey, I will take that Anthony. as a compliment that you. Aaron just thought Robertson. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's the alliteration. It's the. It, a, it literally it says yeah. Aaron in my notes too. I am just not. I do not have it with me today. Aaron Robertson, who yeah. I know his name. He was my first guest of the season. <laughs> I promise. And actually, while I was writing the notes last night, I was literally like, okay, this is going to be a pain in the ass because it's Anthony Robinson and Aaron Robertson. And yeah. it's too close. It's too close. But I know your name. I promise. Yeah. My it's whole life, people have said Robinson or Robertson. I've, I've, yes. I've gotten them both. So yeah, I'm used to it. Yes. <laughs> So thank you, Aaron and MJC for coming for this very important episode because a lot happens here, not just with Anthony, but also with Survivor Fiji as a whole, because this is where we get our first tribe swap. That's a lot. And a lot happens, but in between all of the craziness before we eventually say goodbye to Anthony so it's it's a very sad episode for me but a lot also happens during here and I'm very excited to finally like talk about the full story the full uh journey of Anthony so I'm I'm very grateful that you are able to come on and discuss this with me um Aaron, we've already talked a little bit about mm-hmm. your survivor journey, but or your survivor yeah. Fiji journey, I should say. But MJC, do you want to talk a little bit since it's your first time on Fiji Forever about like your relationship with Survivor Fiji? Sure. So it was funny when you, you know, talked about you said that this episode uh, was March twenty first, two thousand seven, right? Day after, day after my 21st birthday. And so <laughs> I was one of those like really cool people who, while was in college, still watched every episode of Survivor. I had like friends I watched with. Like I I, I really was this is it it I'm I'm really excited to thank you for having me on, Gia. Um I'm really excited to be on this because like I, I podcast a lot, uh, but I don't get to podcast a lot about Survivor. So I'm, I'm excited to to do this. Um yeah, I, I I remember, so, so Survivor Fiji came at a time where it was after Cook Islands, and a, a lot of times, like, those middle seasons get, like, mishmashed for me. I said middle seasons, and it's been, like, 43 now, so they're not really middle seasons anymore. Uh, but no, I, I, I remember uh, this season. What I remember most about this season is, you know, they had this twist I think simultaneously, did The Apprentice have a twist? Yes, where the have have not. Yeah, twist it was like very big at the time. time. Yeah. yeah, it was crazy. <laughs> Sorry, I'm still trying to figure out how to work the system on here, but yeah, it was the have have not twist seems to be a recurring thing on multiple reality TV shows, and they mm-hmm. almost never works because the concept for the the concept and like how they execute it is not good in a competition format because it's literally just overloading one side with a ton of advantages to emphasize this difference on the haves versus have nots Mm -hmm. um teams and you know whether it's in the, the apprentice or in survivor or on some other seasons as well and it just it doesn't make for the compelling television that it does in like 
a sitcom or a drama or something where, you know, like we get like Downton Abbey or some of these other ones where it's like the upstairs, downstairs Mm -hmm. vibes and things like that. It's like that great in a like entertainment concept of like a scripted television or movie series, not so much in a competition where the hopefully you would be able to do like the best of you know you want to feel like the best person wins at the end or that like the person with the most skills uh is able to win at the end and i think that this twist while i still really like survivor fiji it really hinders us from getting to know like the full potential of a lot of potential contestants or like uh, uh, survivor players on this season that probably would have had like a lot of potential had they not been on the Ravu tribe or had been so disadvantaged early on. Sure. So, and even, even big brother did a week of have, have not uh, this week, uh, have not, it's always been, but they they split the house into two. Mm -hmm. And while it was an interesting week, it's not because it was have, have not, like, it would have been an interesting week if it was just, like, you guys are upstairs, you guys are downstairs. Like, they did not need the other group to be, like, living outside for a week. No. They, re- they really should have just constructed the house so that it was, like, equal, like, playing, like, the upstairs had enough space for, like, one half of the house to be, like, living comfortably. And then the other, the bottom half of the house is also living comfortably so it's not right. like they're both at disadvantage <laughs> imagine it being on the upstairs floor and you don't have access to the kitchen <laughs> or <laughs> you have to ask for your meals by basket right yes and yeah so it, it's just not great and they continue with this theme with the tribe swap too and like so in some ways it has a big mix in it like there is a you know, we're finally getting things shaken up a little bit where we are swapping around the tribes, but they still bring up, you know, the one of the big dramatic bits of this episode, like the cliffhanger is which buff is Edgardo going to pick? Because if he picks the orange buff, then he gets to go live on Rabu, which still does not have a lot of stuff. And whoever picks the green buff will get to live on Moto, which has the very nice area and you know like still like has everything that they included in the camp and it makes for some funny television in this piece of it then but it overall it's just like it's like why why are we still doing this because we see the results at the end that like even with like a day's difference Ravu is still losing yeah yeah Although I do really like the challenge this episode because it it was such a nail biter, but I think it's like the perfect amount of brains and mm-hmm. uh, like luck and a bit of like physical capability to navigate through the maze during the immunity mm-hmm. challenge this episode. So I think for like a first tribe swap challenge, this is a pretty good one. Yeah. And I, I will say, um, I think, Given the lopsidedness of of the have have nots twist, this is probably one of the best splits mm-hmm. we could yeah. have had, especially with, in terms of the camps they ended up going to as well. Oh uh, my! Because could you imagine? <laughs> can you imagine tribe. it being flipped? Yeah, I, I I they would have been so insufferable. Oh, the new moto. Really, yes. Oh my god. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And as much as I. I am so sad for uh, Anthony, Mookie, and a a little bit Rocky here at this point where it's like, yeah, I don't feel too bad for Rocky. But, like, the fact that they go back to old Ravu at this point, it's just like, this is is just not fun for them. On the other side of things, Boo, Stacey, and Cassandra may be some of the luckiest contestants of <laughs> wow, yeah, <laughs> in Survivor history because so I this is a bit of a spoiler, but I don't think anything that really ruins the game for or like any stage of the game or like the outcome of the story for me. But like, there's no other swap after this, so mm-hmm. Boo and Cassandra and Stacey are going to be at the Moto Camp for 
the as long as they are there, whether they get mm -hmm. out of they get voted out during the pre merge phase or until they get to merge, yeah. basically. So they are just going to be living in the laps of luxury for the time may be. And I love that for them, especially Cassandra, who has a new like burst of life here in this mm. episode it is so nice to see that like she is getting to work very early on because she recognizes the fortune that she has got not just that she is living in the moto camp once again but she gets to finally be a three free agent here with the how the tribe is divided that it is three moto three ravu and Cassandra was very aware of her position on the original Moto tribe. So this is not the, you know, this is not like the battle of uh, endurance between the two factions as much as it is that Cassandra could really shake things up here. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. She's in the hub of things. Yeah, exactly. And I think it'll be quite interesting to see how things um, develop over at Ravu as well because there is they also were split evenly but now we have Lisi about to join them so that'll be interesting to see what ends up happening there. I do feel a bit weird about how this tribe swap happened um, mostly because it gave Moto another advantage in that it didn't really matter how things shook out one of one person from their tribe was always going to be sent to exile island to get mm. the clues and stuff although i really don't know i think maybe a better thing maybe would have just been to have done it at an even point an even number yeah i don't know or yeah i don't do know song. yeah i so I have a lot of thoughts about this swap, actually, because I like how it was constructed. Like, I like how they did it, where you uh -huh. pick a player from the other tribe and then it mm -hmm. alternates. Mm -hmm. But I think because they wanted to put in the um, the Exile Island twist and that they couldn't guarantee that Moto was going to lose the next challenge. So they kind of yeah. had to strike while the iron was hot because they might not get an opportunity like this again. Yeah. It also, I mean, the the one thing that does bother me about this um, was that Lisi went to, so no one from Moto has been to Exile Island yet because they kept winning challenges mm -hmm. and you pick someone from the other tribe. Mm -hmm. So Lisi goes on to Exile Island for the first time and receives six clues. Which is all, like, why? Which is, not because, earned. Yeah. Because yes, not earned. If that is not a metaphor for Lisi's game thus far, <laughs> I don't know what is. But like it's not like that doesn't make any sense to me. One, because she got all those clues because Moto I'll be so all because of Ravu's turns on Exile Island, and they have been getting clues at the same time as well. But they don't even know what camp she's going on. So we can guess that it's similar structures like whichever tribe she goes on it's also going to be buried mm -hmm. underground somewhere mm -hmm. but yeah and then and jeff also says as they're leaving like by the way like those those clues for the mm -hmm. are still in play I'm like, yeah All right well but, <laughs> and then but then this was something else that bothered me earlier in the season as well because we would see that happen where uh, Earl went once, but he got two clues because Sylvia was there first. And then Yao Man went and he had four clues like the first time he went just because of like the order in which he went to Exile Island. Mm. And that was to me like kind of annoying because it's like, no, it should be however many times you go, you should be getting an idol. But maybe they just wanted people to find the idol as fast as possible because they literally <laughs> did buried it underground somewhere and apparently a machete was not enough to find it <laughs> yeah and um i guess to give vague vague um spoilers for how they do this in future seasons but um they did do i want to say they did fix this or yeah. at least did a, a did a a measure to fix it in uh for example micronesia by having everybody start from 
clue one. Like all the clues are out there and you can find them yeah. if you're willing to look for them. But you're starting with clue one and, and going from there. Yeah. And I, I like that better because at least it's you're all starting from the same um, starting point, no matter whether you've been there multiple times or not. And maybe they could have done something similar here to where you're starting with clue one and then if you're diligent enough and, and patient enough, maybe you'd be able to find the other clues. But Yeah, and I, I do – I love how they did it in Micronesia too. I agree. I think that was a really nice upgrade to how they do Exile Island because of all the twists we have gotten over the years for – survivor i think exile island is one of my favorites if mm -hmm. not like my absolute favorite i just mm -hmm. love the idea of like this other thing going on that can benefit or hinder your game depending how you spin it but then also i it's um the i i like the idea of like how bad do you want it which i think plays out in Micronesia that some people they either recognize their physical capabilities or just don't feel like they need to work as hard as they required you to work during that season to get yeah. the idol so and then other people were able to go through all the steps and I think something like that would have been a really interesting concept in Fiji especially with how many recruits were there because I could definitely see someone like Yao Man going through all of those crazy steps that we saw in Micronesia to find the idol there or at least get all the clues to it in one go and that feels more earned to me than him going the first time and getting four clues at once mm -hmm. but it's also very interesting I like I like this. I am very interested. One of the things that I forgot about or not so much forgot about here was that Earl and Yao Man are still in the scheme to find the idol and they don't have um, they haven't found the idol yet. But then also the fact that they were able to uh, survey their area and figure out where the idol would be in the new moto camp because i completely forgot that maybe possibly one of the biggest downsides to the only downside i would say for them going to the moto camp is that they no longer are familiar with the area and therefore it finding the idol at this camp is going to be significantly harder than it probably would have been at ravu given if they had some materials but we even got a little bit of that in the storyline this episode although we still don't have a found idol Mm. right yeah so i'm very excited about this this is there's a lot to talk about mostly i you know i am very sad about this episode while a lot happens we do lose anthony here this is our second member of the all black alliance that is voted out yeah. um also a little bit of a spoiler but not anything that ruins the game for anyone that is unspoiled at this point, but this is the last episode before the jury starts. And I hate them for doing this because we were so robbed of having Anthony be a mayor of Ponderosa. Ugh. And it was, if they had, it, it was, ugh, if they had just started now, Ooh. I don't care what the makeup numbers would have been. Like, I just think Anthony would be a fantastic representation of the jury. If he couldn't go further than what he did so mm -hmm. i'm very sad that he just he just missed it i know yeah uh, it was so sad it was uh dwight's elimination in survivor 43 it was like very oh, I'm, reminiscent still of this. I know. I'm still not i'm still not i'm like when uh. i get when we get to his final words and he's like he's not in the jury i'm like what what do you mean he's not in the jury i was very upset and i was upset now because i had to remind myself that jury yeah. starts after this episode uh. and this is truly like the end of Anthony as a survivor player for yeah. us but uh, for now I I am always going to be on the Anthony Robinson for second chances train oh for sure yeah, yeah. but I know that Anthony is also a big deal to both of you so before we get into everything else that happens in Fiji do you guys want to talk about Anth what Anthony means to you now or do we want to save that towards the end like what do you Ooh. Yeah. Ooh. 
That's a very interesting question. We'll be I think, able to I think that I think that we can talk about the episode and like it'll Yeah. I think yeah. it'll come through and then yeah. Yeah. like at the end we can kind of like tie a bow. I, I I think that works for me. Yeah. Yeah. Um yeah. Yeah, that works. All right, so before we get into the episode, I just want to reiterate the rules for anybody listening. But this is, as I said in the beginning, an almost spoiler-free podcast. We are mentioning one important detail throughout. There is an all-Black Alliance that the edit never shows, but we will be writing that wrong and highlighting them as we recap throughout the season. But we will not be giving away anyone's placements, including those in the Alliance. So now we are down to three members of the All Black Alliance that are still in the game. That being Earl, Dreams, and Cassandra. Now that we have, now that Anthony is officially out of the game, we can talk about him as like an all-encompassing character. So we can finally, this is part of the reason I wanted both of you on this episode, because now we can talk about Anthony's impact as a whole as opposed to Aaron when you were in the first episode where we could say that we really liked Anthony as a character but you really can't you know for the concept that this podcast is you really couldn't like talk about everything he is and like his full overarching character in the premiere when we're there's so much ahead of for him and i'm very happy that we're finally at that point where i wish he lasted longer i wish we got him for a little bit more but i was very excited that we had the time available so that we really could give anthony the appreciation that he deserves absolutely yeah and so well, with that being said, let us talk about I've Got Strength Now to Carry the Flag. The titles for this season are on point, by the way. OTT. This, they're they're so, great. So, they are so good. Like, yeah. The, the ones that we've had so far have been really good, and it, it gets better as time goes on. So I'm very <laughs> excited. Just another thing that I appreciate about this season, the titles. Yeah. Yes. Fantastic. Shout out Meanwhile, to you, like- man. Yeah. Meanwhile, nowadays it's just like this is the time, or like, do or die. Live in. The vibe of the tribe. Yes. <laughs> Million dollar live decision. In. Like, come on. <laughs> give me some personality. I know. Yes. <laughs> They're really running out of ideas. Yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, it was very, uh, it was very interesting. Shout out to Yao Man. I think he's the first contestant of this season to have two confessionals mm-hmm. in here. Nice. Or I mean, have two uh, titles drops yeah. this season. I could be wrong, but that sounds about right. Who was the first? Yeah, yeah, that sounds right. And congrats to Yao Man for that because this was another one that I completely forgot about like when it happens Mm -hmm. and it becomes at like the final thing we hear before they go to commercial after immunity is Yao Man being like and now I have strength to carry the flag and I'm like (laughs) I completely forgot that's how he said it and it's just very charming and I love it and (laughs) I love to see that Yao Man is finally eating and yes being oh, nourished because he was a tiny man when he came into the channel or came into Survivor, and now they're finally giving him food, and that's just very nice of them. Mm-hmm. And Michelle too. Like, oh my god! Like... One of the things. Uh, this is a very skinny cast overall. Like you can see, especially for the people that've been on Ravu, like Rocky, Mookie, oh, yeah. Michelle, oh, yeah. Yao Man. You can see like how skinny they are in some of these. Like they they are going through it right now. Yeah. And they already were not like they were not particularly uh you know bigger when they started either. No. So this is just like this is, you know, they they are running on empty calories at this point. Yeah, they're like prototypes for for the monster. Although I think you could argue that the that the uh, newer seasons are, are kinder uh, than what we oh, yeah. had in in Fiji because they had almost nothing. So <laughs> I, yeah, even when when they first started advertising like the new era of Survivor where they don't get rice right away and stuff, and it was like this is the toughest. Like they start with <laughs> nothing. I'm like. Did you all just forget Survivor Fiji? Like they Survivor did. Fiji's just like yeah. my drag. Like, yeah. what are you talking about? Of course, like this is not the worst that they have had it at all. Like, Ravu will always be like 
this is about as bad as it can get on Survivor without the letting you die. Essentially. I feel like there's like I feel like there's like main potential where like the 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 guys of the new Ravu and they're like other sur- <laughs> like, uh, every other Survivor season and like Anthony Robinson Survivor Fiji. Right? Yes. <laughs> Like, oh, and, you, you tend the fire there, Survivor Fiji. Like we're gonna go off being men. There, there is there is total meme potential, and again, <laughs> God bless Anthony Robinson because he lived through what I would describe as my personal hell, which is being <laughs> on a tribe on possibly one of the shittiest camps in Survivor history, mm-hmm. where you get absolutely nothing, surrounded by men who can't seem to talk about anything else besides how great it is that they are living on a tribe with other men and they can just go fishing and talk about guy (sighs) things. And Oh my God. Oh, they don't have to, they don't have to talk to women and talk about female issues over. Oh my God. It was like, just listening to it all again. I'm like, Oh my God, this feels, yeah, this feels like hell to me. And it's like, and you can see the faces of like Anthony. And I don't, I don't think dreams really talked a lot during this. Mm. No. During this part where they're talking, where the guys are just all bonding over the fact that they are amongst men. But, like, you could tell that this is what the likes of Rocky and Mookie and Alex have been, like, really waiting for. They just want to be with the guys. And it's it's so bizarre to me, the, this, this, this whole thing. Actually, the first question that I had, um, now that I'm thinking about it, was... I almost wish that Earl had some time to think about it because I almost wonder if he would have told Anthony, hey, the, the idol's under the game. Okay. Or like, look, because I mean, I was looking at Anthony during that confessional where he was talking about like, you know, I'm a nerd, you know, and like they're leaving him to tend the fire and he's by I himself. And I'm like, you could, he's right there and he okay. doesn't know it. And oh it's like, my I just, gosh. oh, okay. God. Brutal. So, This is where I am confused a little bit because for those of you that are not as like that don't idolize Anthony as much as we do, like shame (laughs) on you. But also I did read his teen questionnaire and from way back in 2020 where uh, they were entertainment tonight was sending out these questionnaires to Mm -hmm. a bunch of past survivor players and they would Mm -hmm. answer it and publish them as articles basically it's like a QA for them like about their game but also their life after the show and anthony had a really good one if you guys haven't read it Mm -hmm. i highly recommend it but he said he knew like after he was voted out like the day or two after he knew where the idol was afterwards like he figured it out so i wonder if at some point earl told him like maybe the two maybe like the two clues that he had Mm -hmm. or something that's the only thing i can think of yeah because yaman had more and then i don't think yaman would have told it would have yeah tell anthony yeah yeah. i don't think yaman would have told anthony i don't and this my my guess is that this is something that earl told him like Way early, earlier, like, yeah. Right when he got off of Exile Island, if this is true, again, I'm jumping to conclusions a little bit here, yeah. but I can assume that this is what happened and that they were not thinking that this episode was going to be a tribe swap. So he had it, it like as he's going through all of the things that he could have done differently, he starts thinking about this clue that I'm Ooh. assuming Earl gave him that or told him about and it started clicking about where this idol could actually be. But can you imagine what would happen if Anthony found the idol over the Oh, oh. my god. Uh, what could have been? Mm. It would have like, been so, so like poetic. So good. It would have been like such so a good. moment. If, oh my god, if can you imagine? New school survivor production would have thrown a beware advantage right by the fire, like as oh, yeah. men are leaving. It'd be oh, like, yeah. please take this, sir. You need the help. <laughs> like, think <laughs> of think of the moment in Micronesia where like Amanda pulls out the idol and we didn't know she had it. Just like the moment, like, oh my god. Like, yes. Like, yes. Think of the Nasir moment in Survivor 41, where you're uh. just like, oh my god, Nasir! And like, no spoilers for Survivor 41, but that was like the moment of the season where like, <laughs> you're just watching people, who are like, what, what? And, you know, they, they could have had such a great moment if 
He knew about it and he got it and they didn't show us. Oh, that would have been a moment. Oh, it, it would have been, been amazing. So good. Especially I would the never shut up about one. it. That so oh, good. yeah. Oh. Yeah. He I would have never so shut good. up about it. Like, <laughs> I never would be top tier <sighs> moment forever and always. You yeah. can't tell me any differently. I, I know. It was, it it was really rough. would have been great. That would have been uh, amazing. That's a fun fan fiction. Oh, <laughs> I yes. know. It's the fan fiction I want. For fan fiction writers, we just gave you an incredible prompt. Please write it and send it to us expeditiously. Oh my Thank God, you. Yes. Oh, okay. I need. But I need. so, so I, I really need, I truly, I truly need it. Anyway, guys, there's a tribe swap this episode, and it's pretty much the first thing that happens in this episode, other than Yao Man talking about how he's worried about his place in the tribe moving forward and that he is recognizing that, like, Physically wise, he doesn't have a lot to offer. It is, appears to not have a lot to offer compared to some of his competitors on the Ravu tribe. And I do think this is very interesting because as far as we have seen, Yao Man has not been a serious target for anyone at any point in the game. Even with this like his perceived like being a weaker physically weaker player because of his age and size. But I never really thought about this for Yao man after the premiere and for him to bring it up again, it makes me think that this is probably something that he's been thinking about for a really long time. And that this is something that's always on his mind, especially as Ravu keeps losing. Mm -hmm. So it's just interesting that this is something that Yao Man is still worried about, even though he seems to be very well insulated in this tribe. Yeah, it's this is a a season that is very um, reliant on what tribe you're on, especially yes. if you are somebody that could be voted off as quote-unquote expendable because we need tribe strength in quotes and i feel like that's really emphasized especially if you're on the have-nots tribe um you know if you're on the haves tribe you're probably going to be winning a lot you're probably going to be able to insulate yourself Um, but on the have-not tribe they're going to be wanting to vote off people that are not helping them in challenges and also not with them and so being the oldest there, you know, it's something that I feel like he felt like he always had to prove himself in other ways. So in case of times like last week where he really screwed up that memory challenge, um, that he's not going to be an immediate target for them um, yeah. because he's continuing to, to cost the challenges. Yeah. And I'm wondering because like, obviously we're going to Yao Man hasn't gotten any votes since the first episode, But I'm wondering if this is something that we just weren't shown because he didn't end up getting votes uh, during the previous episode or that people were more focused on the fact that Rocky also kind of lost or was one of the reasons they lost the challenge this episode as well. But it, it does seem very interesting, but especially, you know, like, and they recognize it as well that like every time Ravu lost, they voted out a woman. So um, and there, Mookie and Rocky are bragging about it when they go on to the new Rabu tribe yeah. and, you know, and that they are kind of targeting these perceived weaknesses as a part of, you know, why they think that they should stay over other people. So it's yeah. a, it is interesting to for me to see this moving forward as well. And it, it's disappointing, but... I can understand like why Yao Man is concerned because it just doesn't seem like there's going to be any change for them moving forward. But also, um, I know that this is, you know, Rob, the original Ravu was a tribe that seemed to be trying to do everything they possibly could to just keep their tribe somewhat strong so that they could have a possibility of winning challenges moving forward. But I got to say, if it's not working for you thus far, just (laughs) vote out Rocky and Mookie. Like, they're not, like, who are they aligned Mm -hmm. to? Do Mm -hmm. people actually feel like they are going to be safe with them? Because they are obviously prioritizing very specific type of players over 
the yeah. uh, the majority of their raw boot camp. So at this point, it's like Mookie and Rocky are not winning us challenges. So we might as well just vote them off. I don't know. This maybe this is a bit of new school survivor thinking, but at that point, you know, if you if I always hate the keep the tribe strong mentality, but if you are not yeah. doing your one job of winning us challenges, then you please leave. Please leave at this point. You are certainly not helping with tribe morale. That is for sure. Oh, yeah, no. <laughs> uh, but we get to the tribe swap for this episode and that by, we by are. The way, yeah, oh, yeah. Go on. Um, <laughs> how about uh, tree mail? So, like hinting that there might be like brain teasers and Anthony like getting like psyched about oh, it. My oh my god. No. I was so upset. He was, so bad. <laughs> he was like ba- brain teasers and food. I'm like, oh Anthony. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, this was I I wish I do wish that they just gave them brain teasers. Like that would have just been nice. Like do a Sudoku, please. And or like brain <laughs> teasers to see who's the captain. I don't know. Yeah, that would be nice. Yeah, they have some fun challenges on some other versions of Survivor that I feel like that would be fun to see mm-hmm. them try to do at this point in the yeah. game. But like, especially because Fiji focuses a lot on the physicality of players, that yeah. it would be nice to have a couple more. Like the matching game last episode, it was nice to see kind of a different type of challenge be thrown their way so it would be nice to see a couple more of those moving forward somebody somebody call kalish and like get some like survivor rebuses in there or something. <laughs> yeah i mean especially once you see the absolute disparity between the tribes after a couple weeks like i just feel like and maybe they were trying to oh this would be like the next palau but i just felt like You would think after, and I know that there's some challenges that have to be built like well in advance, uh, especially, you know, the challenges that come more towards the end of the game or challenges that require more elaborate builds. But after a while, I feel like you would want to change your challenges on the fly or at least Mm -hmm. modify them so that they're not. So like um, in the same way that they cater challenges for. Um old versus young seasons to be more even yeah yeah or or men versus women seasons to be where like it's not um emphasizing one trait over another like any yeah. tribe could win and take off with it i'm just i'm really surprised they didn't do that here especially if you know with haves and have nots the haves are going to have an advantage. So the yeah. challenge is to kind of even things out. I don't know. Yeah, they, yeah. Should, they should make a, so, some new challenges, you know? Yeah, yeah. Did you pronounce that correctly? Make, <laughs> make, make, I don't know. <laughs> bring new challenges. Uh, bring, bring back, that back. The, Bring back the word search of Marquesas, please. Oh. <laughs> oh. I would love that. I, I feel like that's the challenge that I would thrive in personally or the boggle challenge from pearl the, islands that'd be great the boggle challenge. yes <laughs> i would love i would rock the boggle challenge more work more brain teasers please less so i like throwing a battleship or something you know we'll be, we'll yeah just... yeah oh that that will never happen this no season. they'll never do that they'll never do that what, what about fly a kite for my cases how about that <laughs> can we, can we get some oh my god out? I would be so like if we're bringing back the challenges, you got to bring back the (laughs) challenges that we have possibly fly and pop a singular kernel of pop. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Too much. I do actually like outside of what we did um, besides like some of the we already discussed. I do like how they executed this tribe swap though where it was pick one pick a person from the other tribe they asked for people to volunteer like one person from each tribe to stand out and um and start like the picking and so it ends up being earl and edgardo and what they do is basically they're going picking from the opposite tribe until they have two tribes of six and there will be one person that is left out and that person you know 
we'll talk about that afterwards because that is a big <laughs> part of some of the drama this episode. So <laughs> it ends up being Edgardo and Earl. And because Edgardo is on the Moto tribe and they have more players, he gets to pick first. And he picks Mookie and then Earl picks Boo. And then they go to the people that they pick and they alternate. So basically it goes Mookie picks Alex, Boo picks Michelle, Alex picks Rocky, Michelle picks Cassandra, Rocky picks Dreams, Cassandra picks Yao Man, Dreams picks Anthony, and Yao Man picks Stacy. And which means Lisey is the last person left, which ha ha. And, <laughs> and, but before we get to that, if, uh, people aren't following along with the picking order. This means that uh, one tribe is Edgardo, Mookie, Alex, Rocky, Dreams, and Anthony. And then Moto is Earl, Boo, Michelle, Cassandra, Yao Man, and Stacy. Now, this is the one and only time in Survivor history where a tribe swap led to a tribe of a singular gender. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. fun fact there, this led to an all-male tribe, and God bless them. Uh, <laughs> the, bless their hearts. And so that happens. Now, here's and, my question before we yes. go on. Yeah. Cassandra's pick, where yeah. she has the choice between picking Anthony and... Uh, Yao, man. Yao. And she picks... Yeah, instead of Anthony. Surprising yeah. or no? I don't think it's too surprising because it. I think it could have been a couple things. Um, it could be that she wanted someone that appeared weaker than her so that if we did, because she doesn't know what Yao Man's position was on the original Rabu or mm -hmm. how people are thinking. So she could be picking somebody that, that could possibly be a target before her. It could be that she felt like she had good rapport with Yao Man on the day one um, moment or like the first portion of the challenge or of a uh, survivor where she thought that that would be a good asset. Or she could have also been saving Anthony to go on to the other tribe with Dreams because mm -hmm. Dreams was the next person afterwards so that they would be so that he could have. A p another potential ally over there because at that point it looks like it's uh dreams with a lot of the Ravu people that were treating them mm -hmm. poorly and on the outs and also uh Rocky who he's been having this public feud with and Mookie who they don't really know anything about at this point so it, it could be also just be something like that where it's like oh well Anthony probably won't vote dreams out and then it's two on each side if they can't get the all four of them on one side through this process. So it could be a lot of different reasons. Yeah. I'd love to hear Cassandra's take on this. I, I'm sad that we don't get an explanation for it, but yeah. or we don't really hear like any of them explain why they picked the way they did. Like Boo picks Michelle. We haven't seen them really interact at all, but it's still, you know, I think that's a solid pick. And um, we don't know why Michelle picked Cassandra either. So I think there's a lot of different reasons why this could have happened. But yeah, I'm not then, too surprised by it. And then we forget about, like, they spent their first three days, like, mm -hmm. one yeah. war style. So, mm -hmm. like, bonds were made before they even split up in the yeah. So that could yeah. have had something to play also. I think mm -hmm. that Earl um, does something savvy with his pick also, where he picks Boo. Where I feel like if he would have picked Dreams or Cassandra mm -hmm. were the first pick, I think that like some people look at each other like, really? Like that's who they're going first? Yeah. And I think that like that would kind of clock the alliance that's like being hidden right now. Yeah. And I don't think that I, I think Boo is an obvious first pick for uh -huh. whoever got the first pick of picking anybody from Moto right. just because he is like he is significantly taller than everyone else there and he's performed very well in the challenges. I mean, Dreams so has too. Yeah, but I'm saying like Dream, but Boo is like a very dominant presence. Like Dream uh -huh. or uh, yeah. Boo is significantly taller. He's like very 
um, like physically uh, intimidating presence. And so I just think that especially when Edgardo goes right out the gate picking Mookie, then there, I'm sorry, he, yeah, no, he picked Mookie, I think. So I think Earl was trying to strike while the iron's hot and pick someone that he, while he could to tip the scales a little bit in their favor of like, I need to get the challenge beast or the perceived challenge beast immediately. Yeah, especially once you see how they pick the rest of the tribe. Yeah, yeah. like there is there was no way if Boo was on the board that they were going to pass up taking Boo yeah. if he didn't yeah. take him first. So, yeah. Yeah, but it's interesting. And I think that it also speaks to something that I really like about the Black Alliance is that they are playing their own individual games, even mm-hmm. though they are closely aligned. So they they do this thing. They have this balancing act that is so hard to do in alliances of yeah. prioritizing your individual winning chances and also operating for the good of the tribe and at the end or the good of their alliance and at the end of the day i think that everyone that is on that is left in the alliance uh dreams cassandra and earl they're all at the end of the day self-interested players they would love to have a black winner this season they want to work together and align while they can but i don't think they would do it to the point where they would sacrifice their own game for one of the other members of the alliance sure neither so i really enjoy that that's one of the things that i really like about these players is that at the end of the day while they did have a goal of securing a black winner for this season that they were also there like they also are self-interested and i think that's very hard to achieve that balancing act when you're in an alliance with a goal as important as this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But then, so usually I don't like snarky Jeff and how Jeff is usually <laughs> very harsh to quitters. Um, sometimes for reasons that I don't necessarily agree with, but Lisi being the last person left leads to a snarky Jeff that I personally can get with because <laughs> she Jeff tells her that he she is not out of the game even though she has been picked and that this means like she will be going to Exile Island and then similar to Sylvia she will be joining the losing tribe after tribal council and Lisi makes this comment about how <laughs> her about how this she's like disappointed because she thinks that this would be a great time for her to go and yeah, yeah and then Jeff calls her out on this it basically says well now you can tell your tribe mates that you know like you won't mind being voted off if uh if you're going to rejoin them and they have this little back and forth of basically him him, him calling Lisi out on her shit and I love it. It's just I was mm-hmm. I rarely root for Jeff over everyone else on the this season, but this was this was a Jeff Hero moment to me. Mm-hmm. Oh, it was so good. It's great. It was so good. And she gets sent to Exile Island and then he basically says, like, there's clues to immunity idol there. Uh maybe you can give it to somebody that actually wants to be here. And <laughs> You know, you could spend your time, go to mm-hmm. Exile Island, and then maybe you'll have your attitudes straightened out while you're there. I'm like, yes, Jeff. <laughs> very, yes! very assistant principal, you know. <laughs> oh, my God. Yes, it was so <laughs> passive aggressive. Very, like, t- yes, very assist. My dad is an assistant principal. So, like, this is very, very assistant principal-esque of yes. Jeff. And I'm obsessed with this. And we – I. Okay, we can kind of talk about Lisi on Exile Island because this is pretty much a reiteration of everything that happened there. And Lisi basically is talking about how she's pissed because she, first of all, she's safe for this round. So, Lisi, count your fucking blessings. But then also, she is mad because she was in such a great spot on the original moto that she did not earn, by the way. (laughs) No. And then, and, she uh now she's mad because her cushy alliance is split up and that this is going to be more difficult for her she also doesn't know what she also doesn't know at this point that she's going to the worst camp so (laughs) this is only going to get worse for her at this point but as 
We begrudgingly gave L- Lisi the winner of episode four because we didn't really have any other options here. But even when she was at her best, she was fairly nasty. Yeah. And I just have to say that, like, this is just prime example of, like, an unearned play an unearned advantage in the game where yeah. she gets on a one of the most elaborate camps possible she has an alliance that apparently just had this natural bond that they were going to form and were the plan was to vote out dreams and cassandra if they were to lose before the merge she doesn't recognize what the negative what the negative parts of this could be if she does continue to treat dreams and Cassandra the way that she is. And then now when a tribe swap finally happens as it tends to do in survivor pre 41, I guess I should say, (laughs) but then now she's angry because the Alliance that she was a part of is now going to be split up as if that was not always a possibility in this. game. Yeah. As as Lisi herself is wont to do, I'm going to do this to her right now. Take the, <laughs> take the L, Lisi Linares, for this episode. Oh, wow. Well, oh, sorry, okay. And L. She does not take the L for this episode. <laughs> yes. She takes an L. It's a, it's a solid L. Here. We, the L. <laughs> we don't have a loser of every episode, but it would definitely be Lisi here because it's just like so... It's so unsensible, especially with how she's been been behaving in previous episodes as well. Like, this is literally what Alex was talking about, like, what the repercussions could be yeah. if she continues the way she is. And she got too comfortable, and now she's on Exile Island, and her alliance is scattered all over the place. It's called being a front runner. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then, I... like, when things don't go your way, like, you know. Yeah. I'm taking the ball and going home. But, but then, like, <laughs> the best player, even Anthony, who knew his chances on this on this new Ravu were minimal. Like, this was yeah. – he was screwed pretty much right away here. And he knew this, and but he was still trying every sense of the way. So even though Lisi does outlast Anthony in this game, I'd argue that Anthony is a significantly better player than Lisi. I would, yeah, I would agree. He – is he is trying every step of the way he does not go down swinging even at tribal council and is pushing as much as he can trying to pull every option that he possibly could have to stay over rocky and it's not his fault that this is how the tribe ended up and there i usually i don't use swap screwed a lot but i think that this is a case of yeah anthony had a pretty rough go of it here he did um, I took uh, I took a screen cap of yeah. the clues that that Lisi had because <laughs> I have to say, like while she's whining about it, she's been given like literally a gift I... in her lap. Like, can we can we talk about how obvious these yes. these clues are Please? and how almost unnecessary these clues are? I know she got they're... six, but like <laughs> they're so they're so redundant at this point. Okay. But please yeah. read them. Yes. So the uh, it, it cut off the first clue, but the second clue, which is the one that Earl had and the last one that Anthony heard, was basically saying that you need to become centered under the highest point through which you have entered. So that, you know, he's kind of looking under the center of the highest point of something. We don't know what that is. Then clue three is the first clue to mention a cave. So we get when night has fallen and the tribe is asleep, you'll find it under the cave's threshold if you dig deep. Clue four says, here you won't find the idol you crave. It's buried under the highest point of the big cave. Yeah, you you said that. (laughs) Clue five, under the entrance, under the ground, right where you're living, the idol is found, which is more vague than clue three or clue four. Why is this clue five? That makes no sense. I think they were just hoping that the idol would be found at this point. because clue five and six are more vague than clue three and four yeah. like what because clue six the one that Lisi got is the highest point the jutting point the edge of the lip below dig 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 and save yourself from the fatal blow i would have reordered these clues because yeah. it, it's like clue three and four clue three yeah. alone 
was you know like search in the cave okay great like awesome and then the group four is like it's under the highest point of the cave and then they were like oh wait we need to make it vague and then for clue five and six they're like oh and somewhere gotta dig yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's weird <laughs> they should have Even... taken the they should have taken the brian mcknight back at one approach where like yes. clue four <laughs> yeah. is like reread clues one through three <laughs> Oh, yeah, yes. they were really grasping at straws at this point. And even last episode, Earl got all of those, the <laughs> all of the clues except the last one. Uh, yeah. He got up to clue five when he was on Exile Island. And literally the only Exile Island excerpt we get from him is him reading all these clues and saying, I know this already. Like, this is not <laughs> helpful to me. I'm like, I know it's really not helpful. Someone just dig on it at this point. Like, yeah. I, I don't know, but it was, oh my God, it was. Clue seven is, what's up, Earl? How you been? It's like, we have painted an X over where you need to dig. Please, <laughs> dig just here. fucking find it. Yes. Oh my God. This is my favorite recurring storyline that isn't actually a storyline on Fiji. It's just the repetitiveness of these idol clues. Yeah. Another reason why they should have done, like, the person that goes will get an extra clue for however many times they go. Right. And it also encourages people to switch up who goes as much as I love the likes of Earl and Yao Man and Sylvia when we got her, say when we still had her in the game, getting like uh, being on Exile Island repetitively. It's nice to have this moment here where – um, you know, if Earl had gone a second time, he would have only gotten two clues at this point, and it would have been more of like a mad dash between the people that know that the idol is at camp, and it's kind of a hidden secret at this point. Right. But then, but after Lisi leaves, the big question is who's going to what camp because they have not taken down the moto camp while they no. are gone. Oh no, the haves haves not twist is still very much in play here. Wow. And they <laughs> are going to choose just from a bag whether or not it is going to be they're going to Ravu or they're going to Moto. And Edgardo wins the rock, paper, scissors between him and Earl. And he gets the privilege of getting to choose the buff and seeing which tribe they're going to go to. So he yeah. picks the buff from the bag. It ends up being orange. And... That means they are the new Ravu. Mm -hmm. Much to their appointment <laughs> to delight here. Now, first of all, I do have to say when Jeff asks who's going to live on Moto and Boo immediately says, we are like, <laughs> that was fun. I cracked up during that. It's like, so no, good. no room for hesitation. He was just nope. like, oh, that is fine. I will take that off your hands. No, <laughs> no worries, Jeff. I did love that part of this episode. Um, but also, is it really a privilege to pick the buff out of the bag when you can't see it? It's just no. like, a, like, it's just basically like, oh, you will get the blame for why <laughs> you are at the camp you are at. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Which I'm fine with. We haven't seen a ton of Edgardo too much yet. They like, oh. I, I feel like they are just wanting us to kind of like treat Edgardo and Alex as one at this point. But we, we're getting a lot more confessionals from Alex than we are from Edgardo. Yeah. Yeah. But then, so even when we're like at this all guys tribe, I don't really know what Edgardo's perspective on it at this point until we start getting to after the immunity challenge because um, he starts talking about how like on a personal level, he prefers Anthony over Rocky. But other than that, like, we don't really know a ton about him. Right. Yeah. But, okay, so do we want to talk about the new Moto or the new Ravu first? Let's start with Moto because we're yeah, going to be with Ravu for a while. Okay. So. <laughs> so Moto's quite interesting. This will yeah. be the tribe that is immune this episode because they win the immunity challenge. Mm -hmm. And they are three Ravu, three Moto. But the problem is that Cassandra, who is one of our Moto folks, knows she was on the outs while she was on Moto and is now yeah. looking at this as an opportunity to be a free agent, which 
I love and I'm very happy about for her. This is the yes. type of karma that I want to be like happening in the universe. That, like, <laughs> Cassandra has finally gotten a second chance in this game. This is like a breath of yes. fresh air to her. She's still at the nice camp. And this is just going to be a new opportunity for her moving forward. Uh, one thing that I thought was really sweet was when they're all eating together at the new camp and like Boo and Cassandra and Stacy, but particularly Boo is like making sure that all of the Rabu members eat enough and that they're not eating too fast so they don't get sick. So it was really sweet, even though they are all like trying to plan their demise along the way. But mm. it's it's very sweet. It's like a nice little sweet moment between them and that like everyone is just like excited to be at this camp with the good fortune that they have and they're just want to like appreciate the time that they're getting together as a tribe before stuff really starts to get real. Yeah. Boo seems like a, uh, like a very kind hearted person, which is like funny when you think of like, yeah. you know, how he got onto the show and his connections, like yes. outside the show where like apparently <laughs> him and like Russell Hans and, and Shannon uh, Sh survivor Shannon. Yeah. Like big, like, friends with yeah. each other but no you know it just seems like a like in that moment that is very kind of him to say like yeah yeah you you guys have been like emaciated for two right <laughs> like, have had it <laughs> yeah so it was just I really it was funny that was funny that he said Earl do not get into bed dirty <laughs> no, <yeah. laughs> I forgot they won toilet trees last episode so I oh yeah right I wonder if they used it all yet or if they're going to be like they're going to have them shower finally. Oh. It'll be interesting. But they, yeah, so new Ra or old Ravu that is now on the new Moto at this point. This is where things start getting juicy because between Cassandra who was fully aware of her position right now, mm -hmm. Earl is ready to take this to a like take advantage of the situation to the nth degree like this is this is really an opportunity for Earl and it shows through this episode because he recognizes that he was very lucky with the people that he swapped with because Michelle and Yao Man are both very strong allies of his they've almost mm -hmm. always voted together um, they're all about the team and tribe unity and I think that they it both are uh, think of Earl very highly they have a, a lot of respect for Earl and I don't think that from what we have seen it doesn't seem that these are players that are looking to turn on Earl anytime soon no. so this seems like a strong trio of the two trios that are on this tribe this is uh, this is the stronger trio in the mix and now, now that he is recognizing this position he knows that he has he just has to flip one person over on that tribe to have the advantage should they lose and go to tribal council and this is very interesting for them because we know that this black alliance is a thing mm -hmm. um but that cassandra has lost her only ally over on moto because her and dreams are on different tribes at this point and She's looking for new opportunities and she takes full advantage of it. And Earl takes advantage of the fact that he is looking for this opportunity to really strengthen his power in the game as well. And they both have some really good confessionals here. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, while, you know, Boo is very disgruntled because he knows what this likely means for him is that, like, this is a big obstacle in the sure. way of what he calls his million dollars. <laughs> and, you know, certainly a lot of confidence in there. Like, good for you for, you know, manifesting that for yourself, Boo. But he is he is worried and. Earl knows that he's worried and he also knows that he should be worried because of the Cassandra factor of it all. Um, but Earl just drops some really good lines in here. Like it is, this is like a, a survivor mastermind in the making. Like we are witnessing greatness right here. And I cannot emphasize enough how amazing oh, yeah. these moments are. Mm -hmm. It is oh, so, so good. good. So good. So I know Aaron, that you saved the uh, 
you have uh, the confessional on video, I believe, because we couldn't find like a written version of that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I do. Let's play it because I, I even from words, I cannot emphasize how great this confessional is. Oh, yes, y'all. Yes. Buckle up. Get, get ready. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. A word or two here and there in the right situation. You paint the picture the right way. She could be right on my side. I appreciate you bringing the coffee. Sure, sure. sure. Guys. Yeah, I'm trying to do something. It'd be nice to have a little meat. I have Yao Man. I have Michelle. They're all about the team. All you need is that one vote. And then who has all the power then? That would be me. So good. So good. It's so good. It oh is. my god. It really it's, is. <laughs> it's, that is some real gangster shit right there. Like I don't yeah. think oh, this wow. is like this is like a quote from The Wire or something. Like this is something that would get like the title drop. Uh, it was mm -hmm. so good. Earl recognizes the potential of this tribe and the power that he can hold and he is milking every second of this possible so even while we are looking at a black alliance and also the fact that we are starting to get earl and yao man as a duo let's recognize who is like the strategic powerhouse in both of these units right now it's earl like that is he mm -hmm. recognizes like his his great qualities here and for someone that has not seen the show before he went on like the the power that he has here is so impressive it really is and uh, mjc were you gonna say something no okay okay um but yeah i'm just like very i'm very excited to see what is in store for moto because i they go through uh, they go through a lot of alliances moving forward and some things that don't quite make sense until we get to the merge but i i think that they do this tribe ha goes through a lot socially and i think right. it's for the best for that unit of six as well like that is a that is definitely a group to uh, watch for the little signs moving forward which will lead to some of the bigger decisions at the end of the season i would say yeah so it's it's funny how just like the backing score to that confessional, like how oh, different so it good. could be. Like, like it could be like the, the Dodo music, you know what I mean? Like it could be like yeah. the moment where like the overconfident person is like about to be voted out that episode. Oh yeah. Like, yeah. No, like this is like dramatic. Like, Oh, you like sit up at attention. Like, Oh, like he, he might be onto something. Like, something, yeah. Something's cooking here. It's so good. Yeah, I agree. And it, it is something that if you weren't correct about your assumptions, yeah, you'd get the Dodo music. We'd be laughing about like how overconfident he is when they you're, just you're, went you're into Drew a swap. Christy. Yeah, right. exactly. <laughs> Basically, he's a badass, but Earl is actually a badass in this instance. Yes. No, and it's like it's yeah. it, like it's like you said it's like the, it's the wire. It's it's Heisenberg. You know what I mean? Yes. Like this is Walter White. Like I am the danger. Yes. Like yes. I'm the one who knocks. Or it's like, oh shoot! Like, Earl just went there. The yeah, he man. did. Take a yeah. shot at the king. You best not miss. Exactly. Ooh. Yes. Exactly. Uh, yes. This is this is so good. I if, if uh, Earl was a the wire character. I think he would be. I know he's giving me Stringer Bell vibes here, honestly. Oh. But like, like at but pre season three. <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> I don't know, but it's like very. It was very good. I I enjoyed this a lot. Um, anything else we want to talk? Oh, they are and. So we don't get a conclusion to the story quite yet. And we see in the previews that this is going to be a continuing storyline here, but that Earl and Yao Man are still worried about finding the idol. And even though they are on Moto, they are, um, they are able to get like a general idea about where the idol is. And, they, they're not as worried about it over here because no one else has been to Exile Island from this tribe, so none of them know that the idol is at camp. Right. 
Yeah. So this is uh, this is an interesting setup, yeah, but I think advantage. it's yeah, it's a huge advantage. I like this a lot for them, and I like this just in general about this idea that in the early stages of Exile Island, you know, you think that it's an advantage to go to Exile Island and have the time to search for the idol, but really the advantage is that you have this piece of information that yeah. no one else knows, being that the idol is at camp, and like technically anyone could find it but they have no reason to think that the idol is actually at camp either no yeah so that was my last piece on moto do we have any final thoughts for them because this is really the last we see of them of the episode yeah no, no, no until the challenge yeah. like yeah we're done with yes that. all right are you guys ready to talk about ravu <sighs> new ravu <sighs> Yeah. All right. So here's okay. it, yeah. what I, I'm gonna. I'll, I'll start off easy. One of one of like the all time funniest moments in Survivor to, to me is, you know, all the, the the guys are like broing out and freaking Alex Angarita says, you know, one of my favorite quotes from the Count of Monte Cristo, the movie. <laughs> oh my. Like, all right. All right, bro. And then. I don't know if Alex knows what a quote is because he like does like a two paragraph long like scene from the movie and like <laughs> clearly like he's like memorized this thing that he's like seen like a thousand times and no one like here like a, a, a quote is here's looking at you kid like that's a quote from a movie yeah. what he does from the Count of Monte Cristo it's not a quote bro like it's just a long thing. But my favorite thing is after he finishes saying it, is like Rocky being like, "Yeah, bro, I say that all the time. I say it for every challenge." <laughs> what are you talking about? First of all, there's the count so of Monte. First of all, there's a count of Monte Cristo movie, and also, why it's would you movie, watch the count of Monte? The movie was better. <laughs> the, second of all, why? Yeah, also, you're quoting a movie and not the book. <laughs> it is. is- such and also, a, you watched like, a count of this. You watched a count of Monte Cristo move. I would not be telling anybody that, but that's not something moment. I would admit Robin, on TV. Rob and Josh uh, during for Evolution of Survivor have like a really good laugh about it too. Where it's just like every time I see it, it just tickles me. Just how <laughs> ridiculous that is! <laughs> it's like, <laughs> yeah, rock on. Okay, so. Alex, without spoiling anything, I will say, Alex quoting the Count of Monte Cristo movie <laughs> is a great analogy for him and his game. That I will say that much as we move forward. He has last till the next episode at the very least, and I, I cannot wait till the time we get to talk about Alex as a full character in the show because this will be quite interesting. But yeah, yeah, you know. <sighs> You know, something that I didn't really think about until I watched it this time is age. I think something that I've I've done, you know, as I've gotten older and I've gone back to watch Survivor Seasons mm. is like, oh, now I'm the same age as this player. Oh, that's kind of interesting. Like, what yeah. kind of perspective do I have? So um, I will I will age myself. Um, right now, I'm 28. So I'm the same age as both Alex and Rocky are at this point uh, on this tribe, which is weird. That's weird. Um, and, you know, the the interesting thing about this tribe dynamic is that Anthony is older than all of them. Mm -hmm. He's the only guy in his 30s on a tribe full of 20-year-olds. And they're all talking about him. <laughs> We're... We're men. I, and yeah. Men. And like, this is the guy that's lived the longest in the world. You think he, you know, like, right. I just, yeah. it, 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 was, it was the disrespect for me. Like, it was, yeah. I, what, I just, and it, uh, is, the, it, that's the frustrating thing is that, like, you need to speak for yourself. But I'm like, I, uh, yeah. I, okay. It's a you definitely, watch, but <laughs> that definitely helped put, this in perspective to me because I'll actually be 28 in uh, nine days. So 
I'm a, I'm about to be the age that Alex and uh, Rocky are when they played this season. It's hard to picture this too because I know Dreams is one of the youngest in the this cast. Yeah, he's, he's, he's 24, I four, think, when he yeah. plays. But and Mookie, Mookie's really young too, right? Yeah, yeah. Mookie's like 22, 22, yeah. 20, something like that. Yeah, remember. so they're both like fairly young. So I have, and I work at a college, so like Mookie is like the age of like students that I work with. So it's like putting that that type of content into perspective because when I watched this, this was originally aired, it's just like they're all adults. Like I didn't mm-hmm. know there was an adultier adult. Like there's like different levels sure. to adulthood, but there certainly is. And you can even see it. Like let's let's call it what it is. Like just because there is like a very similar mentality amongst this group. Uh Anthony is by far the most mature of the players that are on this tribe where Mm-hmm. You can see he's kind of like, and he can't say this during the episode, but like you can tell that he is like a, um, that he is kind of over a lot of this like toxic masculinity of this tribe. People mm-hmm. flexing about the fact that they're just so happy to be on a tribe with other men. They've been voting out all the women because they can't deal with women issues mm-hmm. and things like that. And Rocky has this really funny confessional about how he's talking about how like he wants he just wants to let the viewers know by the way rocky does like women like oh, yeah. he loves making out with women he loves talking to women yeah like he just so you know guys know like no homo but he's happy to be on a tribe with all men like let that's basically the confessional that we got from him <laughs> this episode and but Anthony is just a different level of maturity. And even when they're talking about like how happy they are to be on this tribe, you can see Anthony, he kind of has this little like Abbott elementary moment from like yes. timer J- Tyler James Williams, where he like looks at the camera. Cause he's kind of in disbelief about everything that's going on around him. And that, that is what I get from Anthony here. Like Anthony is living my personal hell right now in terms of survivor of being on a tribe of all men that are just so happy to be on a tribe with all men. And he is living that in real life right now. And it's so, it's so interesting too. And I, uh, Mookie's 24 as the same age as dreams. So. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and Edgardo's actually also 28. So that's that's so another interesting thing here is because I feel like Edgardo's more mature than all of them. And they're all the same age. If you, t- <laughs> if you told me Edgardo was like in his 30s, I would believe you. I, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's, it's really interesting seeing the dynamic of guys in their 20s versus Anthony who's in his 30s with more perspective and like what he focuses on and what's important to him and like Mm -hmm. and you know what got to me too was jeff (laughs) was 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 jeff uh at at tribal oh yeah i just we'll get to tribal but we'll get to tribal council because that also annoyed me i just I'm, you know, it, it's, this is, I guess, looking at it from a survivor perspective, the tribe is split evenly, 3-3, three, mm-hmm. three, and it's very clear that um, Dreams, Alex, and Edgardo as Moto are tighter than Rocky, Anthony, and Mookie mm-hmm. as, as Ravu. Yeah. And so you would think just from the perspective of Moto that Dreams would have jumped ship immediately yeah. over to Rocky, Anthony, and Mookie. But once that dynamic started playing out and, you know, Dreams couldn't really save Anthony and it just it yeah. just seemed that all the other guys kind of, all the guys in their 20s got together. Um yeah. I mean, it makes sense that way. And Rocky is trying to do anything to make sure that he's in the tribe's good graces because he basically just gave the tribe dynamic all the way over to um, Moto. Yeah. And it's not like Rocky and Mookie 
have been on the same page the whole season anyway. So even that, like, on surface, they might have been tight from a perspective of convenience Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. rather than I don't think they would have actually worked together, let's say, if their tribe was was winning and doing well. I felt like they would have been – they would be on on opposite sides because they were on opposite sides since since episode yeah. one. Um, they were, but, but I will say right. that that Alex and Edgardo, unless I'm like remembering the season incorrectly, were almost not not defending the Cassandra and dreams, but were kind of chiding Lucy and Stacy. Yeah, treatment of them. So yeah. like it's like they they it was as close as those two got to like having defenders is people like Alex and Edgardo being like, will you be like a decent human being? And will you not like treat them like terrible people? Yeah. I think of anybody that dreams could have been swapped with. Um, these two Alex and Edgardo are probably the best people he could have been swapped with to remain loyal to Moto, especially if Cassandra was not there. Sure. Yeah. Um, and I think in in this dynamic, then um, yeah, because otherwise, I think if even if actually even if it was a situation like let's say for some reason like Alex or Edgardo was on exile and it was like Lisi and the other one there, I don't know if Dreams does the same thing here. Like I don't know if he I don't know if he sticks with them in the same or if Stacy was here on on that tribe with them. I don't know if he would stick with them either. Mm -hmm. I think it was the two perfect people to make sure that this kind of fell the way that it did. Because it might be interesting to see like what would have happened if it wasn't all guys Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. and some of that dynamic was broken up a little and it wasn't um, basically a situation where Rocky would have needed Anthony to have a majority. I wonder if this plays out the same I don't think it does I think it's interesting too because we don't get a ton so when they're all talking about like how great this tribe is and stuff the people that to me and correct me if I'm wrong that seem the most quiet about this are dreams and Anthony like I don't really remember dreams really chiding in about this either where they're Quoting Monte Cristo and, uh, (laughs) you know, like talking about how great it is. They don't have to deal with any more women on the tribe and they're worried about getting laid after this or things like that. Like, I I don't remember dreams really contributing to this Mm -hmm. conversation as much, at least from what we saw in the edit. And I think he does like everything we see in this episode leads me to believe that dreams did want to work with Anthony, but Mm -hmm. I think that a few things are in play here that Mookie is been kind of like need to spite some of these because of like this is probably the closest to the type of person he wants to align with. Whereas mm-hmm. now he is swapped over to the tribe and he's very easily pulled into this alliance with Alex, Edgardo, and Dreams. It's like yeah. that's going to be the core four of this tribe we haven't seen a ton of Mookie interacting with dreams quite yet but we will get that um right in like the the following episode as well so it'll make things a little more clear but it it seems like now Mookie this is even though this swap you know could have been better in terms of them getting the camp that they wanted and even Mm -hmm. though they lost this challenge the swap really could have gone better for someone like Mookie who Mm -hmm was kind of like grasping at straws at this point over yeah. at Ravu. He was only right in the vote about like 50% of the time. Like mm-hmm. sometimes he got his way, but sometimes he didn't. Right. So there was just a lot of mechanisms there. And I don't think that even though Mookie was probably the person they would say is like the physically strongest on original Ravu, I don't think he had like the social capital to last past like, final maybe like the if there were four of the original Rabu left like I don't see that trio of um Earl Michelle and Yao Man really breaking up at any point either because those were the ones that were always like voting on the same page right yeah Yeah. so I think I think you know we, we get into a situation where um 
five of them are going to go crabbing and fishing and one person is to stay and tend to the fire. I, I, I think that like a good, if you want to be a good leader and a good like human thing to do, instead of saying like Anthony will stay behind, everybody else will go, is to say, hey, does anyone want to stay behind and do the fire? And if nobody says right. anything, then, then you can like delegate. But in that moment to be like, hey man, like you're staying behind. And it's not like, like where, where are the five going off to? Like lift heavy boulders? Like, no, they're fishing and crabbing. Like They were, <laughs> they, they how many himbos does it take to catch one <laughs> crab in a rock? A lot, apparently. A lot. At least five. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and I think that this is like, also let's say, so Rocky, Rocky's argument here, which isn't really an argument, but more him saying that, like, Anthony should stick up for himself. Well, what happens in this situation if if Anthony says, you know what? No, I don't want to tend the fire. I'd rather, like, that puts me at a disadvantage, so I'd rather go fishing, and someone else can do that. Then we're going to get a bunch of confessionals about how difficult Anthony is right. being, or that mm-hmm. he's whiny, mm-hmm. yeah. that he's not, mm-hmm. he's mm-hmm. not being a team player so Mm -hmm. i feel like this is a lose-lose situation for anthony either he goes along and hopes that he's able to curry favor with some people which almost worked because it seems even when we get some of these votes in and i'll read some of them when we get towards the end of the episode but it doesn't seem like this is something necessarily that they want to do and in terms of contributions to camp life dreams even says that anthony contributes a lot to camp and rocky doesn't so Mm -hmm. You know, like he, he, to him, Anthony is a more valuable player to yeah. keep in the game. But so I think Anthony did a lot of things right, even in his boot episode. It was just the wrong try for him to be swapped on to. Absolutely. Like, yeah. yeah. I think ultimately, too, I think this comes down to Alex's perception of, of Anthony, because I think. Edgardo and Dreams were probably more pro Anthony than pro Rocky for several reasons. Um, and I mean, yeah, Mookie is, uh, you know, is somebody that um, they would want to work with. And I, I just think, yeah, I just think they, there was a scenario where, um, Rocky could have been voted out here instead. Oh, there um, definitely is. I just think, yeah, I think Anthony really needed to appeal to Alex, but for some reason, Alex saw Anthony as weaker, like the, the weakest person here. Like, it's just, it was just yeah. so, it was such a weird thing to, and, and my thing too is, what is Alex's long-term goal here? See, and what's so going to help him get there? Because yeah. I don't, because clearly, you know, he, in his confessional, he already dismissed both Anthony and Rocky. Yeah. And so if your goal is to, you know, let's say link up with uh, Lisi and Stacy and, and all of these uh, people that you're working with on your new tribe now, mm-hmm. um, wouldn't you want to keep around people that would be easier to get rid of later? I just yeah. feel like for many reasons, Anthony would be a better person to keep around at this point over Rocky, because let's say you never have a chance to get rid of Rocky ever again. And then yeah. now you're stuck in a situation where you're not working with Rocky and he has the chance to, you know, win immunities and take things away from you. I just, I, yeah, I feel like you're yeah. just setting yourself up. See, okay. I'm glad you brought this up because a- Alex has a very big part of this episode. He gets a lot of confessionals. He's kind of the narrator of the mm-hmm. new Ravu. And he, I, I, first of all, he comes off a little condescending in some of his confessionals where he's talking about, he recognizes that, Dreams and Cassandra are being treated poorly. He recognizes that Anthony is a much more amicable player than Rocky would be. And he recognizes that Rocky is not treating Anthony well, like repetitively. And he wants to side with Anthony on a lot of these issues. But then he doesn't. And it because it's not a him problem, you know, like they're going to vote out. He I think 
he decided early on that if they lost, they were going to vote out Anthony just because of perceived tribe weakness. So he can pretend to go back and forth with a lot of these concerns. But at the end of the day, he's very much like not a um, he I think he overestimates his intelligence in the game too much. And this will not be the last time we have this conversation about Alex, Mm -hmm. but he isn't really thinking about the fact that like, what could Anthony bring to the table further on or what can Rocky be bringing to the table further on? Where does dreams equate in this situation? Because dreams, like let us not forget one episode earlier, Dreams is talking about how him and Cassandra are going to flip the moment that they have the opportunity to. And I think Alex thinks that because that was Stacy and Lisey's doing, that it's not really an issue with him. But I don't think that Dreams really recognizes it as just a Lisey Stacy problem. It is he was on the outs on yep. Moto. Moto had five people, including Alex and Edgardo. So for right now, because they are swapped in together, it is in Dream's best interest to work with them. But that is not going to be necessarily a long-term thing. Like, I think he is still very much thinking about what is waiting for him on the other side, especially since Cassandra is on the tribe that won this immunity challenge and that is on the camp with the most advantage. So I do think that this is this is a larger conversation to be had, but I think that there is a lot missing in Alex's uh, like strategy for this game. And I don't know if he necessarily has an end game plan moving forward if these other mechanisms don't work out for him. Like, I think he did just as much as he wanted to do to try to move forward. Like, he pulled in Mookie. So now there's a four of himself, Edgardo, Mookie, and Dreams. Like, that's the four on this tribe currently. That's all he needs to have time for, and now he can move forward with that four yep. right now. And they're about to get Lisi back, too. But I don't think he is planning for, well, what if something goes wrong? Like, what if dreams flips on them or what if they lose so many times they have to vote out another like several more people and they have to start making some of these difficult decisions so there's a lot there's a lot of what ifs in here and i think that that this kind of is where we start to see where maybe some of alex's gameplay is not as well thought out as he believes it is because right. he was by far one of the best strategists on moto but also a lot of the Moto tribe does not know how math works with uh, the alliances flipping back and forth. So that is not no. necessarily uh, the, we are grading on a curve here. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Do we want to talk about tribal? Yeah. So, oh, well, first off, in case you guys didn't know yet, Ravu loses immunity. And yeah. it's the thing where <laughs> um, – they do the little – it's like they're all linked together at this chain and they have to, like, navigate through the maze. It's really cool. I actually really like this challenge a lot, and it's very close. But, yes, it is – Rabu loses. They're going to Tribal Council again. And um, the one thing I do want to say before we get into Tribal Council is that in spite of everything that happens this episode, I love – Anthony's resilience no matter what so he we he has this confessional that I love that I couldn't even like that hasn't come up yet but it it meant a lot to me he has this episode this moment in the episode where he just owns up to the fact like listen he knows who he is he's a nerd he's a geek he's a dweeb he recognizes that he's not going to relate to the people on this tribe but he is going to keep fighting for his place in the game even after they lose and he knows that he is like in panic mode at this point, like he has dreams on his side. Dreams does want to keep him, but he needs at least one other person for a tie. And he Mm -hmm. needs to, what he really needs to do, as you said earlier, Aaron, is that he needs to convince Alex and Edgardo that keeping him is better than keeping Rocky. Yeah. Yeah, and then, but I, I think he has a couple really funny one-liners here. He calls himself, like, the black male Cinderella <laughs> at Cinderella. one point. <laughs> oh. 
<laughs> and he talks about like uh you know he's uh talking about how like he's uh waiting by the fire and like all the burly men are going out to like go hunting and stuff like he he has just, just this lovely sense of humor that i am such a big fan of and i really enjoy i really enjoy anthony even though we don't have you know we don't get anything more because he's voted out here and just before the jury but i really enjoy him as a character and these are the moments i'm going to remember him for is like those moments of resiliency those moments of him not giving up and uh staying true to himself like those are the reasons that we love anthony so much absolutely yeah all right are we ready to talk about tribal council (sighs) it is a doozy yeah Um... all right so you know, the reason why I specifically wanted to talk about this episode is that I wanted to talk about, so when I first saw this episode, you know, again, in 2007, a day after my 21st birthday, um, like I, it, it made me very angry. Um, when I watch it back every time, it makes me very angry. Um, I, 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 I think that that Rocky for all the, 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 the times where like, yeah, like he can say funny things sometimes and like he, you know, he's, he's, he uh, makes for interesting TV sometimes um, his behavior in this episode and the previous one uh, I think is, is, is absolutely appalling. I think like the idea that, um, a an empathetic uh heart centered person who is an introvert is any less of a man mm-hmm. than you are is like that's like the, out of the stone ages bro like it's like it's such a so bad like it's it's you know i i, I consider myself to be like a very heart centered person and I, I consider myself to be someone who like if someone like Rocky would, you know, would would see me on Survivor, like I think he would say similar things about me, and it just mm-hmm. like makes me feel it, it, it's it's like if this is what it means to be a man, then like what right. what like what the hell, dude? Like I so I I work as um. A teacher's aide in a special education classroom in middle school. Like I am the only, I'm the only like man who is a teacher's aide. I'm the only like yeah. I'm one of few like men who work in special education. And it's like the sort of thing where it's like, you know, I can hang out with the bros and I can bro down with the best of them. You know what I mean? Like I, mm-hmm. I can. You know, talk about like, oh, like, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, talk about what I think about, oh, I think that woman's hot. And I think that like, you know, let's talk sports. And let's do, let's like, I can bro down with the best of them. I can also like be the only man at a table of like, at a lunch table of all women and feel very comfortable there. It's the sort of thing where it's just like the, the, the word effeminate is so like, it's such like um, a, a loaded word. Don't you think, Gia? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it's usually like – and I I hate this because like I don't see femininity as a bad thing. But it's often used as an insult to people like men and women. But usually use like especially in the context of like this season, they're using it to insult Anthony and like say that he's not – like a real man and this is like part of the argument that Rocky keeps trying to make is that he's like he's not like as manly as Rocky and he's trying he's like telling him he has to man up and things like that but uh there there's a larger conversation to have about how femininity is like used as an insult where women uh and especially men when they embrace openly uh effeminate traits or traits that could be categorized as in some way or just even not masculine it's used as an insult to say that like you are not 
a you are not the same level of man or as a uh, strong of a person as I am essentially yeah. like that is essentially what we are getting to in this in this argument and if there's a larger conversation about it about how like femininity is not any different or any better or worse than masculine traits it's just that one is valued more over the other in society and it's a shame because I am also someone that you know I I categorize myself as a nerd particularly a survivor nerd so Anthony really resonates with me in that way I've also unfortunately like I had some uh dealt with some bullying in my life and I think that when uh, seeing Anthony persevere through that when I was younger meant a lot to me, like more than I would ever think back then of like, this is, this was a comfort character to me in a lot of ways. And like seeing Anthony be so strong throughout the season, but also that like masculinity isn't necessarily just like, it just categorized as like, being able to bro down with the guys like, you know, like there are positive ways to express masculinity that isn't just tearing other people down. And I think Anthony is a really great example of positive masculinity in my eyes. I think that he was a really great character to look forward to. And I don't think he did anything wrong here. And it's unfortunate that he is leaving before some of the people that think this way, particularly Rocky and Mookie. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I think that in 2023, you know, we're, we're, you know, 15 years later, like, I think we are in a better place as a society yeah. where something like, um, like sensitivity in men is yeah. something that like is, is, is applauded. It is a characteristic mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. you know, people, appreciate as opposed to well you're not as much of a man as me because like yeah. i've seen like i i you know i i i've seen you almost cry like yeah that's it's like it's a real emotion like you're yeah. out there like playing survivor and he gets into it with his final words about like listen just because i'm not like yelling louder than that you are doesn't mean that like mm -hmm. i'm any less of a man than you and it's the sort of thing where um you know for for people that uh have been watching uh uh the circle this season it came up where one of the what one of the 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 players one of the catfishes is like accused in public of being timid and their response to that is to go over the top aggressive. And everyone's like, whoa, 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 why are you so aggressive? I'm like, because I'm trying to tell you I'm not timid. Like what, what, yeah. what you, like, what do you want from me, man? Like, mm -hmm. it's the sort of thing where I feel like when Anthony in tribal gets like a little bass to his voice and he like starts to do yeah. what Rocky's been asking him to do, which is stand up for himself, which like mm -hmm. screw you, Rocky. Like he doesn't yeah. need to like answer to you. But the minute that he like starts to like, you know, get loud too, Rocky's like, yo, yo, you're being too sensitive again. Like you need to calm down. Like what 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 <sighs> he I, can't I, win. I, I despise people who have ideas on masculinity. Like Rocky do, I, I, and it always, always bothered me watching that, and it's why he is one of my least favorite castaways ever. It's because like it, it just, it's, it's, it's too much. I, I, I don't know. What, what do you think, Aaron? Yeah, it was like watching this live. I just. It was it was it was like seeing my nightmare on a, on a TV screen. I mm -hmm. felt like I like recluded back into to myself. Um, and I actually remember exactly where I, where I was during this episode. Um, it was a week before my um, I was in band at the time in middle school, and <laughs> we were about to take a trip to Cleveland. So I, I'm in Cleveland for the following week during next week's episode. But um, yeah, it was. Uh, 
being unapologetically who you are can take many different forms. Mm. And I feel like, especially out here, people are very quick to assume, well, everybody holds the same values I do. Everybody expresses themselves using the same metrics that I do, even if we look different, you know, as long as they're doing the things that I like, we're fine. And if they're not doing it, then I'm going to tell them the way they should do it and they should behave like me. But when they behave like me, it's like, whoa, okay, no, that's too much. It's, it was, it was, I just, yeah, I don't even know how to put it into words, but I, I have so much respect for Anthony in the way that he carried himself because it was just, it was frustrating seeing it not only come from the contestants, but also from Jeff. And it was, yeah. it was one of those moments where it was like, wh- like, why are we asking if Anthony wants to be here? Like, he's not Lisey saying like, oh, right. oh, yeah. wow, I wish I was leaving right now. Like, you know, he wants to be here. Like, why are we asking this? Yeah. Like, that's not what they're basing this vote on. It just, it just felt like a pile on for no reason. Like, just say you're trying to protect yourself and you're voting out Anthony because you like the other guys better and you're trying to fit into whatever dynamic y'all came up with. Like, why are we going through this whole shenanigans of you should stand up for yourself? Because it's not why he's being voted out. And like him standing up for himself is not going to change your mind as to, oh, oh, he stood up for himself. Well, guess we're going to have to pick somebody else. It's like yeah. that's not how that's gonna work. So yeah, exactly. So unnecessary. And I also just want to kind of squash this idea. So uh, again, also in um, Anthony's quarantine questionnaire, he does still keep in touch with Rocky. Like they are on good terms now, which is great to hear. Obviously, but we are talking about like the show itself. Mm-hmm. And I just want to squash this idea in general about like the the narrative that Jeff was trying to push was that like. Rocky's just giving him tough love by treating him poorly like this and that he just wants him to like stand up for himself and things like that. And while their friendship has like resolved over the years and like they have worked things out on their own time, which is great. Um, it, 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 this is not the case. Like, you do not use that excuse of I am mean to you because I want the best for you or that I – Um, you know, I am mean to you because I want you to like stand up for myself or like I am like pushing the boundaries of tough love here because I care about you and I want you to be better. I want you to be more like me. Like that's just a toxic way of thinking. And it's unfortunate that Jeff was pushing this narrative during this time in Survivor because that's really not what this is. And I think that you two both uh, have – um really beautifully explained your thoughts on this and the frustrations that we feel watching this and seeing Anthony be treated the way that he was. And I, and that's all the more reason why we appreciate him so much. And I'm glad that we got to cover why Anthony means so much to us and why he's such a strong player, even though he was sadly voted out unanimously here. Um, Not without trying though. Like he really did, go down swinging from the very last moment where he does really stand up for himself, even if Rocky doesn't like the way that he was doing it. But I'm really happy that we got to know Anthony as a player. And while I wish that he went further in the game, I'm really happy with the content that we did get from him because he was a really like, he was a really strong player to me and he's someone that I have always held like very near and dear to my heart of like survivor players that mean a lot to me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, You know, without, without Anthony Robinson being the, you know, the, the, the blurred prototype, like we never get on the show. We never get like so many of the, like the, the future blurs that we end Mm -hmm. up getting. So like, you know, good on you, Anthony. He's a trailblazer, a game really? changer, really the is. icon, really the legend, the moment, mm-hmm. all of those things. Absolutely. Yes, a hundred percent. So we are at the end of the episode. Do we want to, before I read Anthony's final words, is there anything else you guys want to say about just like Anthony Robinson, the player? 
I think Anthony Robinson, the player, had a lot of untapped potential. Mm-hmm. And I wish we could see him play again. That's, that's I agree. Day. So this is Anthony's final words. And I think this kind of, you know, these words will be important for later as well. But he says, uh, I'm a little pissed off. I'm a lot pissed off. I'm mad at myself for apparently not screaming to the world being a jerk. Apparently that's what you need to prove that you're out for a million dollars. Regardless of what Rocky says, I have great social skills. I'm not what was wrong with that tribe. It was Mookie and James. Those are the problems with Ravu, and that's why they're losing, and they're going to continue to lose until both those guys are gone. These words His will power. come up again in His power. the future. Uh-huh. Yes. These, this will be uh, an important fact for later. So, you know, Anthony's power transcending episodes that he's not even in. We love to see it. What an icon. Are you guys ready to talk about the awards? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yes. All right. Yeah. So let us get to it. It's our part that we end every episode with. Aaron, you were with me the first time at where we uh, yeah. awarded the entire Moto Tribe because they got the nice <laughs> camp in the premiere. Uh, <laughs> since then, since then, we have only had individual winners with uh, Mookie winning episode two, Michelle winning episode three. Lisi begrudgingly winning episode four and Earl being the winner of episode five. Um, but let's get to our first two awards, which we do individual winners for each. So, guys, what is your best confessional of the episode? Um, ooh, my favorite confessional. Oh, best, it's hard because I like my my first thought was the the, the confessional where Anthony's talking about how he's He's a blurred, but I think for this episode, I think I'm going to have to give it to uh, one of Earl's confessionals that I didn't play uh, where he was like, um, you know, oh, I think Boo is worried now that, now that we're here and, um, you know, things, things are going to change around here. Like every, everything is going to go through me, you know, all the information is going to go through me. Can't do anything without telling me first. Yeah. (laughs) I agree. I really like that one. What about you, NJC? I mean, I, it has to be the one that we played where Earl's saying, you know, who has all the power? It's me. <laughs> it's, it, it's just, it, it, it's, it's so good. Moment. Oh. <laughs> I am going to say that Anthony's I'm a, I'm a nerd speech is going to be my favorite because Earl has some really solid ones, but I want to give it to Anthony as well because he has Mm -hmm. been a really consistent narrator throughout the season. And I'm really sad that we miss him in the pre-jury phase, like that he is a pre-juror, but he was such a good narrator throughout the season for the time that he was here for the early stages of the game where a lot of the stuff feels kind of repetitive, but I think that Anthony was a really strong one throughout. So um, I think that that's that's who I want to give best confessional to. So let's let me just type that in. Okay, and then funniest moment. I mean, for for me, it's it's Count of Monte Cristo. Count of Monte Cristo. <laughs> Not the book. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. <laughs> All right. I'm going to say Boo saying that they'll take the um <laughs> the nice camp. That's very funny. <laughs> because I, I complete like that one a lot. <laughs> so I think when I listened to when I was watching this episode last night, I, I feel like I like chuckled and rolled my eyes when Alex is doing his quote of the Count of Monte <laughs> Cristo in here. But uh, sorry, the Count of Monte Cristo movie specifically. <laughs> yeah. But when I completely forgot about the boo thing this episode, and when he did that, I actually laughed out loud. Like that was <laughs> I don't I was not expecting that. I did not remember that at all in all of my rewatches. But it still cracked me up. So I will say that boo saying they'll take the nice camp. Mm-hmm. Okay. And finally, we have who wins the episode. Oh. Now, I said our past winners. 
I have two people in my head and I kind of want to like, because one is not as obvious, I think as the other one is. So I would like to go out of order you as I normally do and say who I think my two potential winners of this episode would be. I have two names as well. Okay. So first, I think this one will be very obvious is Earl for all of the reasons that we discussed earlier. I think Earl is in a great position. He is definitely making the most of his time there. We don't see Moto getting voted. uh, Like, I, we don't see Moto going to tribal council here. But I think even if they do, Earl is safe here. And I think he has a lot of good opportunities in front of him. But more importantly, he recognizes that he has a lot of good opportunities in front of him here. My other pick for winner of the episode slightly less obvious but i think that cassandra yep that was my second name i think she has a good case for winning this episode because this is truly the second wind in the game that she needed and like earl she does also recognize that her position in this game and that this is a new opportunity for her to really change things around for herself and I, I think this idea that she recognizes how much power she potentially holds is really important. And it's also not her fault that she doesn't get as many confessionals as Earl. Like she does not have the, she does not have like a say in how many confessionals she gets or how whose perspective the episode is aired through. So I, I think that like while Earl has maintained his strong position and that he's using this opportunity to expand his power. Mm -hmm. I really think Cassandra is kind of the winner of this episode for me because this is truly like a game changing moment for her. Mm -hmm. But that was my, that was my two. Yeah. My two were also Cassandra and Earl. And I was thinking Cassandra, um, especially with the, the tactical um, pick of, of making sure that, um, Dreams and Anthony ended up on the same tribe together, especially mm-hmm. after um, Dreams just got picked before she had her choice. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought that was really good. She gets rid of, I mean, this this tribe swap could not have been better for her. She gets rid of, uh, and through winning immunity too, she gets rid of Lisi, you know, the biggest naysayer mm-hmm. to her that was on the tribe. She gets some new people coming over that seem to be very interested in wooing her her and getting her on their side Mm -hmm. while still maintaining relationships with, with um, Boo and building one with, with Stacy, especially now that Lisey's out of the picture Mm -hmm. um, and is on the other tribe. So I think, yeah, I think this is a a, a huge win for, and as you said earlier, uh, one of the luckiest people to ever play this game uh, being (laughs) on the Moto camp you know, this whole time so far. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah I, I, I like that. One other person that's like off the board that I was thinking of, sorry, I'm going to call for a second. Give me a uh, rip for a second. <coughs> you guys didn't riff what else did. All right. Anyway, oh. <laughs> I was, I was so invested in watching this. I had to hit the call button. Um, one of the people that's off the board that I think had a really big episode uh was Michelle Yee just because mm. she was so like she needed sustenance like she was wasting away she's like such a little person and to be able to swap over to the have tribe like she's in a good position now where um like it looks like the things are going to swing in her favor if Cassandra comes over and then she um is playing a less out in front game than Earl is and so mm-hmm. and another really clutch thing was that she was one of the major reasons why her tribe ended up winning immunity um as like the the short person in like the front of the thing like she was able to climb over uh ravu's little like Mm -hmm. you know sticks and everything i actually did a good job of kind of like quarterbacking the team and kind of using the fact that like she is so like little and spry to like be able to like 
get them the victory that they needed there. So I yeah. thought that she had a, a, it was a very good episode for her as well. A quiet one, but a I, good episode for her. I agree. And also yeah. just, I feel like in like honorary mentions, it's just like the uh, Earl, Yao Man, Michelle faction have all won in some way because really they have. have swapped over to the nice camp. And <laughs> in that way, that is always a win for them. Um, also, also, you know, also dreams where like, you know, Dreams was on the bottom of the, the the previous camp, and like he's got like a new, he's kind of kind of got a new life with the swap, yeah. and of course, like I think he wanted to stick with Anthony and have Anthony around, but like he's not on the top of the chopping order there now, where it's going to be, like you know, it, it looks like uh, he's in with the group of Mookie and Gardo and Alex, so. It looks like it's going to be Rocky and Lisi are like lower than him on the totem pole. So that was like it was a, it was an important yeah. uh, it was an important episode yeah. of Dreams as well. This does seem like a new. I, I was worried for Dreams when we got to this swap about like what this would mean for him, but I right. I think that this is still he's in a he's in an okay position here, and I think that that's not too shabby for him. Like I did not expect him to be in this alliance with uh, Edgardo, Alex, and Mookie like two episodes ago. So I think that this mm-hmm. is – this is definitely an improvement for Dreams in his position, yeah. which I like. I do want to just highlight because obviously we are talking about the all-black alliance. And while Dreams – we saw Dreams during the episode say that he wanted to keep Anthony over Rocky for many reasons. We also know that he has an all-black alliance with him. But also when we he didn't air his voting confessional – but um, he does say in it, when I'm looking it up right now, he says in his vote against Anthony that he's sorry I couldn't save you this time. Mm-hmm. So what I think that means is that Ant- I think Dreams did as much as he felt he could do to t- try to keep Anthony over Rocky here. And I yeah. think that it was just because this is a tribe of six and four of them seem to be set on voting for Anthony over Rocky that he couldn't stick his neck out to vote uh, vote with Anthony as well. And I, I think that's fair for Dreams that he needs to um, – He needs to be self-interested, but even though this didn't work out this time, I think he did as much as he could to pitch keeping Anthony here. Mm. Um, I I kind of want to give the win this episode to Cassandra for all of the reasons we have discussed, even though I think Earl also had a really magnificent episode here. Yeah. 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 I think it. I think in terms of like who like most improved from in their position from yeah, episode definitely. five to episode six, it's definitely it. Cassandra. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, guys. This is the end of episode six and the end of an icon in his survivor journey with Anthony Robinson. I cannot thank you both enough for sticking with me through this two hour podcast and also um, helping me through and like uh, really eloquently explaining how much Anthony means to all of us. And I really enjoyed all of the like in-depth conversations we've had about this episode, because I think that this is an episode that really hits hard for all three of us. So I couldn't have picked yeah. a better panel for this episode. And I'm really glad that you guys were both available for this and that Yay. you were able to work around my insane schedule. So <laughs> I appreciate you both so, so much. Yeah. I, I yeah. Time, Gia. Thank you so much. Yes. I'm Thank excited you. for all the episodes to, to come, especially this oh. next one. Oh, so Aaron, excited. you will be... <laughs> Um, my guest for next episode specifically requested that they would get the episode where Michelle falls. Uh, yes, not a medical. Yes. yes. So, so uh, no medical evac, I promise, but there is quite a fall this episode. It's in the preview, very, right? It's in the preview. In, yeah, it is. Yeah, okay. it's in the preview. But, yeah. but it doesn't result in a medical evac, so I figured, like, that's a spoiler I don't mind sharing because it's literally our next one. But... All right, guys. Um, MJC, thank you so much for uh, for joining us for this episode. Uh, I'd love to know where can people follow you, and is there anything that you would like to promote? 
Sure. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter on the at MJCSZN. Um, so you can follow me there. Uh, I also um, have <laughs> relaunched uh, my old podcast pilot season. Uh, and uh, the, the, the great Gia was my first guest back in a, a long time. So that was really I was exciting. honored. Absolutely. I just uh, did a well, it's supposed to be a quick one with uh, Jordan Kalish about the NFL playoffs. Oh, we ended yeah. up talking for a very long time. Oh, and uh, it was as a ridiculous quick conversation. As, <laughs> as ridiculous as most yeah. of our conversations are. So if you're interested <laughs> in that, check that out. Um, more uh, more goodness to come out of it. But uh, yeah, uh, thanks for having me on. Thank you for coming on. And Aaron, where can yeah. people follow you and what would you like to promote? Yeah, um, I'm uh, the Orange Double A on Instagram and TikTok, T H E O R A N G E D O U B L E A. Um, I have two podcasts that I host now. So the first is um, Great Typhoons and Raging Fires, where I'm going through all of the Disney animated movies, uh, live actions, and movies that incorporate both. Uh, and just going through the history because there's a lot that I have not seen before or only seen once. So it's been a, it's been a fun journey. So this week I'm going through Robin hood will be coming out on, on Monday. And then Ooh, I love Robin hood. I I was starting. Uh, I just started a, a, a new podcast this year called Sparky Sparky Book Man, where I go through all of the published materials of the Avatar The Last Airbender universe, especially since it seems in the next few years we're going to be getting a lot more Avatar material, both uh, in TV show and in, in, in book form. So, yes! yeah, so let me go through that. And then, I... um, oh, sorry, finally. Oh, uh, <laughs> You go, you go. Uh, finally, I've guessed it on uh, Words of the Witches, which goes through the published materials of the Charmed TV series. So if you're a fan of that, check out Words of the Witches. Uh, so much knowledge, so much uh, love put into that. So, uh, so, yeah. so, yeah. These all sound amazing. I cannot wait for these new episodes to come <laughs> out. It's going to be so good. Um, and as always, you can follow me at Classically Gia on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok for all of my reality TV shenanigans. This is a Survivor podcast about diversity, so you guys should definitely be following the Survivor Diversity campaign also on Twitter, at Serve Diversity. That's at S-U-R-V Diversity. Um, no, right no. now, what was that? No, I was going to say, Gia, if people wanted to hear a spoiler-filled discussion about dreams heard where can they yes. hear that oh yes so uh, i was getting to that but uh um, oh. yes so on rhap the wonderful kevin and nigel uh invited me on to their you thought you knew podcast about one of my favorite survivor players of all time also happens to be a survivor fiji alum and that is dreams heard so Take a chance to go on to uh, wherever you listen to podcasts, go on RHAP's Survivor content and look up You Thought You Knew Dreams Heard. It was an incredible discussion. Kevin and Nigel came with a lot of statistics that I didn't even know about, and I Ooh. consider myself the number one dream stand. Wow. So this was a, a there there was a lot going into it, and it was so much fun. This was a great time, and also uh, we answered the all important question of is dreams heard a villain? Oh. So yeah, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it was a lot of fun, and I I stand by my answer on that. So I'm very excited to talk about that in depth, and yeah, I can't wait to hear the finale episode of this podcast so that we can really talk about all of the characters of Fiji in depth. Everything, so yeah. that'll be that'll be a great a great time. Um, and also speaking of which, Abbott Elementary is back and so is my post show recaps coverage with Chappelle. We are doing bi-weekly coverage on this Ooh. and we just talked about the premiere. So good. This past episode was very funny and I'm very excited to be talking about that as well. And on Silent Podcast, all of my regular Survivor content will be back on March 1st when Survivor 44 premieres as well as my Inside Survivor coverage with Christine Palin. So stay tuned for all of that. 
Thank you all so much for listening once again to Fiji Forever and for my lovely guests for joining me week on weeks and weeks on end. I am very appreciative of all the support that I have gotten from my guests and also from listeners. Uh, we will have episode seven out fairly soon, I believe. Uh-huh. So please stay. Uh, please. Uh, stay tuned for coverage on that but it's a pretty funny one and a lot happens here and I'm very excited to be talking about that so once again thank you all for supporting uh, Fiji forever and stay tuned for more coverage coming your way (laughs) 